This week on The Encrypted Economy, we are fortunate to have Linda Phillips, Yev Muchnik, and Jacqueline Radabau of J.R. Weiner on the podcast. This firm has really been doing a lot of work with DAOs looking to constitute as cooperatives. I was so looking forward to diving into this topic with them because there is so much to cover. A cooperative might not be the right structure for every single DAO, but it is definitely a structure that facilitates decentralization in a blockchain-based ecosystem or privacy-enhanced data-centric ecosystems. Now, there's a lot more that this podcast has to unpack for that in future episodes. But in this episode, we talked about the origins of cooperatives, specific use cases of how they are used by DAOs, some of their fundamental principles surrounding governance, contributions and patronage, securities law exemptions, and of course, taxation. J.R. Weiner was so patient with me as I prodded them quite a bit regarding how to reconcile the contribution of infrastructure and other critical services with a fully decentralized co-op. Maybe I overplayed it, but if you are like me, the notion of patronage-based returns takes some conceptual adjustment. They were fantastic, and I hope their conversation and responses on this facilitates your own understanding. At the time of this podcast, we weren't able to coordinate it with the publishing of their DAO co-op paper that was sponsored by the DAO Research Collective. But look for that in another week or so. Welcome to The Encrypted Economy, a weekly podcast featuring discussions exploring the business, laws, regulation, security, and technologies relating to digital assets and data. I am Eric Hess, founder of Hess Legal Counsel. I have spent decades representing regulated exchanges, broker-dealers, investment advisors, and all matter of fintech companies for all things touching electronic trading with a focus on new and developing technologies. This is Eric Hess with the Encrypted Economy, and I'm so excited to have attorneys from Jason Weiner uh, Law Firm in Colorado on the podcast. Now, we have Linda Phillips, Jackie Radabau, and uh, you have uh, Muchnik on the, on, the, on the podcast, and we are here to talk t- today about cooperatives, uh, a, t- a hot topic of conversation. Uh, particularly as people are contemplating decentralized organizations. And this group, we have the dream team here. Uh, and I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Uh, we'll start with Linda, then Yev, then Jackie, um, and then we'll get into it. So uh, first of all, welcome all. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you, Eric. And uh, this is Linda Phillips, and I am uh, an attorney and based out of Denver, Colorado. I've been working with cooperatives for about 25 years, and I joined uh, Jason Weiner PC in uh, 2011. Jason and I did some work together converting Namaste Solar from a a standard limited liability company into a worker co-op. And uh, co-ops has been my my go-to business model for years, and I look forward to our discussion today. Thank you. Yeah, I'm Yev Muchnik. Um, I went down the, the crypto legal rabbit hole back in 2016 um, and have advised a number of companies uh, between then and now, um, whether with their with respect to their token issuances, with their governance models, um, with custody, structuring, regulatory compliance, you name it. Um, I've kind of seen the, the industry mature, and it's been really rewarding to to stick around for this long. Um, I joined Jason Weiner's firm um, about a year and a half ago as of counsel, and we connected on um, structuring the first DAO co-op in Colorado called the Employment Commons LCA, um, and have uh, have worked on a number of these alternative. Um, organization structures and alternative financing structures and um, have now pulled in Jackie as a very valuable resource as well to to pioneer the DAO co-op. Jackie. Yeah, I'm Jackie Radabaugh. Um, my background is a little, from outside town, feels a little all over the place with having practiced law in Brazil and Europe before practicing here, but I've uh, focused quite a bit on corporate taxation for a few years before doing nonprofit work and getting into shared ownership of land and real estate assets and in Texas with um, the University of Texas Entrepreneurship Clinic. 
and um, I'm based in Dayton, Ohio. Uh, I moved uh, a little bit in between New York, Texas, and then Ohio the past few years to help a community-based enterprise, community-based groups to um, start their business and run it in a collaborative um, way where they actually do get to share equity and the profits and the benefits of it uh, as a community. And so I've been doing that for about um, just a little over four years in Dayton, joined Jason Weiner's farm uh, earlier this year. So I'm getting a closer year and now, and I uh, have been um, the, this past summer collaborating in between the very traditional cooperative work uh, or traditional as far as traditional can be within the cooperative practice, but then overlapping some blockchain um, and that work with uh, EAV's um, new development. So it's, it's been really fun here and I'm looking forward to, to talking more about it. Great. So to, to, to get into it, and I'm, I'm really so excited about this podcast, even though I think I butchered a couple of names, but that's really par for the course with me. So we're, we're, we're right on track. So um, first, let's start off with what is a co-op entity? I think I'll, I'll take that one. Um, and then Linda has, always has stuff to add, um, relevant stuff to add. Uh, so cooperatives can be uh, business entities. They can be a governance of set of values and principles, a way that you really do business and organize your enterprise. Uh, it can be a basic set of principles. So we often talk about uh, the Rushdale principles that came up in the 1700s in um, England, the Mondragon principles that uh, kind of are the basis of the Mondragon cooperatives in Spain. Uh, as far as statutory uh, business entities go in Colorado, they can be um, Article 55, we call the, them um, eggs and electric cooperatives typically choose that as a business type uh, or form. Uh, Article 56 cooperatives, many states have adopted a similar uh, cooperative corporation statute that guides um, and most cooperatives have adopted them so far. And then Article 58 in Colorado, the Limited Cooperative Association, that's kind of a flex um, model in between the cooperative corporation and the LLC model. So it can be um, ways of doing business in a variety of things. So it, it can be a way of really running the business in a collaborative way. So sometimes you're just cooperating and then you're, you're running a cooperative uh, in that sense. So it depends on who you're talking with and what you're talking about. All right. And, and Jackie, when you were talking about Article 56 and Article 58, these are sort of the, the I guess, some of the, the, the key articles as it relates to Colorado's cooperative law. Now, Linda, you know anything about those those articles? Were you involved at all with them? <laughs> yes, I was involved with both of them. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give you a little. I'll give you a little history of, of co-ops um, in the United States. I, I uh, have been was lucky enough to work for an attorney by the name of James B. Dean, D. E. A. N., who uh, was instrumental in helping Colorado uh, revise and adopt new co-op statutes in the 1990s. Uh, that went from the standard, most most states in the, around the United States have agricultural co-op statutes and rural utility co-op statutes. So your rural electric associations, your rural telephone associations, but many states do not have any type of cooperative corporation statute. And Colorado didn't either for many, many, many years. Um, and then in the 1990s, mid-1990s, Jim Dean and a group of other attorneys here in Colorado revised the Colorado Ag Co-op Statute to allow it to apply to other forms of businesses. And that would be any form of business, uh, whether you're an industrial business, retail, uh, 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 commercial operation, real estate, all kinds, any, any, anything that you can form a business um, under corporate law, you could now form into a corporate cooperative. Then in the, in the, uh, mid 2000s in 2010, from 2005 to 2010, Jim and a professor out of South Dakota, Thomas Gooey, uh, who's a law professor up there, were the two co authors of the Uniform Limited Cooperative Association Act passed by the Uniform Law Commissioners in 2010. And then I got to help on a committee here in Colorado to get it passed here in Colorado as Colorado's Uniform Limited Cooperative Association Act. And it's been passed in six or seven states, maybe eight states now. There are a couple of states, Minnesota, 
being one, I think Wyoming being another that had similar uh, LCA statutes, limited cooperative association statutes. And um, I think there's 10 to 15 of them now around the country that are available. Um, uh, some new ones, the state of Washington just just passed a good LCA statute, but even Washington, D.C. has a limited cooperative association statute. Great. And and so when we talk about cooperatives, they have some, I think uh, Jackie referenced it, some very fundamental principles that, that apply to them. The seven principal cooperative principles are voluntary open membership, democratic member control, cooperation among cooperatives. Uh, member economic participation, concern for community, education, training and information, and autonomy and and independence. Great. So, and for cooperatives, what makes them so appealing to the members? Cooperatives were formed originally as sort of a self-help organization, where you have a group of people coming together to help themselves either with purchasing power, with selling power, with manufacturing power, things that they could do as a group that that, uh, was much more difficult to do as an individual. And the the agricultural cooperative community is a good example. Uh, You have a single farmer out there. If he wants to buy fertilizer and seed all by himself, if he doesn't have a co-op to go to, he has to pay higher prices um, than he would if he went to the co-op. When he wants to sell his crop at the end of the year, uh, rather than trying to sell it himself, uh, he can sell it through the co-op and the co-op gets better pricing because it's bulk pricing. So it's, it's, a, it's a self-help organization and that's what, that's what benefits the members the most. Great. So when we think about how cooperatives have sort of developed in the U.S., um, how how would we how should we think about it in terms of like if we were to break them into buckets? Like I know we have there's the agriculture supply chain, there's the public utility, there's the worker base. Is that the way to think about the different classifications, or are there more that we should be considering? Yeah, I'd say that you could if you want to two big buckets, you can say um, that you can typify them by membership type. So you're looking at a producer cooperative, those are members, right? The producers are members. Marketing cooperatives, you have you know co-op, the co-op markets, the member products or services, your the purchasing cooperatives, the cooperative uh, bulk coordinates bulk vendors, uh, the how the maybe the housing cooperatives, you have the residents. So you're doing per membership, who are the membership classes? And we're seeing a growth in multi-stakeholder membership because you're talking about this multiple members of classes. Or you can typify them by sectors as well. So agricultural cooperatives, the construction, uh, cooperatives in manufacturing sector, we're seeing a growth in tech cooperatives and those can within them have those classes of memberships that you have workers, um, users, if you're talking platformers, but also kind of focusing on a sector um, se- sector specific uh, formatting because you know, if we're thinking tech, because they're using their platform so that maybe they're using a website or an online platform for it or DAOs, they're adopting tokens. So you can, I think the two big pictures would be from my perspective, membership and sector types of cops. And and so when we, we think about all the changes in technology, which sounds like a loaded statement, right? But when we think about all the emerging technologies, where do we see, um, you know, when you think about it, where do you see natural fits for the DAO structure in in, in sort of these decentralized economies or, or even in, in the um, with some of the new emerging technology use cases. Yeah, so I think it's it's important to kind of step back and just talk about how DAOs are, are being formed, right? How they came to be and what they mean specifically. So um, kind of at, at a rudimentary level, DAOs are unincorporated associations. They're people who come together for a common purpose. Um, they can be non-profit, they can be for-profit, they can be for in investment, pooling in capital and resources for investment purposes. Um, <clears throat> because DAOs are layered on kind of typically the, the Web3 layer and um, utilize smart contracts and essentially code to to operate and govern themselves, um, they've, they've sort of emerged spontaneously without any kind of 
formal legal structure, formal legal wrapper. Um, and a lot of that is really because there is no kind of precise formal legal wrapper that, that fits kind of DAO needs um, exactly. Um, so they have been spontaneously kind of mushrooming as, as unincorporated associations and treated as general partnerships. And with general partnerships, there are a number of issues that come up that <clears throat> I think in the last couple of months have, have come to the attention of a lot of DAOs, which is um, this unlimited liability that can be imputed to across all of the members, um, some of the tax uh, implications of, of not paying your taxes. Um, if you are um, making distributions out of your treasury or um, even for kind of investment purposes, if you are making donations or grants. Um, so uh, these things are, I think that kind of the, the philosophical pursuit has been there to to create DAOs and these these communities, internet communities that are um, that are run democratically. But then, kind of all of the, the lawyers started coming in and um, and scaring uh, scaring people off about all of the things that can go wrong. So um, our uh, solution, and not not even solution, but really um, what we found to be a really kind of organic fit is is the the DAO co-op structure, which is fitting um, in taking these principles that we alluded to earlier and fitting it into an LCA, um, just because of the the values alignment, the ethos alignment, and the flexibility of the LCA structure. Great, um, and so you know when we think about the 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 DAO structures, which DAO structures do you think? are actually better suited toward the co-ops like if if you have you know because different DAOs have different purposes which where do you think it, it naturally fits I mean one to me seems clearly sort of these these you know pure builder communities where they can collectivize and they can be insulated from you know protected from liability to a certain extent and then they could paid get paid out for wor the work they do into it or artists and similarly contributing into and receiving something from is that the right way to think about it or or you know is there another way to sort of think you know which DAOs make might make sense to to go the co-op route versus versus not the way i've been thinking about that i might need uh Linda's help on the patronage aspect, but it's really thinking about how, what's the relationship in between the DAO member with the entity and how that enti that the group as an entity generate profits, right? So, um, and then in co-op parlance, we call it just the patronage activity is a cooperative provider service. The member purchases, um, that's patronage activity. The cooperative is developing something, as you mentioned, with uh, the devs, the workers are part of how you know, that the profit is generated to the entity. They're contributing their hours. That's their patronage activity as uh, members, as worker members, worker owners. So I think whenever we can define well that relationship and the activities of the members in the cooperative outside of just simply participating in decision making and simply putting capital money into it. Um, if you can define their activity outside of those, it's probably, uh, it might work. It might, the cooperative format might be a good one for, for the group. Great. I'll also share that the other week I was uh, at the NFT NYC, NYC NFT conference, and I came upon one of Yev's clients. Uh, or somebody that you haven't worked on. I guess I won't share, but the, the exact name, although I don't think they'd really care. Um, but it was basically one for employment, uh, basically all the 401k, all the employment services um, for it. And you know what a you know what a brilliant use of it because you know particularly for DAO communities themselves or or different structures trying to like manage you know in a decentralized fashion. All these different structures, uh, they had built a DAO around it. That seemed compelling because obviously it's something that a lot of communities need. And by sort of pooling, you know, by by having it within a single co-op structure, they can all, uh, I guess, con contribute some services or or otherwise, and also benefit from it. So this is Opolis and the Employment Commons, and so we collectively sort of help them find the appropriate legal and technical framework, and and found that the the LCA is sort of the best suited, but um, 
I think I do think it's worth doing a little bit more of a deep dive into how that particular DAO co-op is structured. Um, and they have, um, they're sort of aggregating um, as a, a producer uh, services co-op. Um, and so they're aggregating and, and utilizing collective bargaining power to obtain better pricing for benefits and um, healthcare for their members. Um, but they're, their membership structure is actually multi-stakeholder. So they've got a employee member class, they have a coalition member class, um, and each sort of interact with the co-op in different ways where the employee members kind of use the services of the co-op um, and, and and earn pa- in patronage through what they call payroll mining. Um, they've got a, a a formula for their tokenomics, which is based on um, how much payroll is mined and how many epochs are um, are kind of opened up based on the volume of, of payroll. So um, their patronage is represented through the work token, um, which is can be staked or distributed to the members. Maybe we should just sort of like break out, um, you know, as we start to talk about the interactions with, with DAOs and, and even otherwise, some of these, you know, some of these core underlying principles, um, such as, you know, one member, one vote. Well, what the fundamental principle is democratic governance. Um, most co-ops, I would say 99, eh, maybe not that high, 95% of them, it is one member, one vote. But the statutes, both the cooperative corporation statute, as well as the LCA statute here in Colorado, allow you to vote based on your patronage activity with the co-op. And that's why patronage and defining what is patronage is so important in a co-op. Some of the statutes also allow you to vote based on um, your equity in the co-op and how much equity you have in the co-op. So there are different voting structures that you can do with a co-op, but the majority of them currently are one member, one vote. In the context of patronage, it it doesn't raise um, decentralization concerns because that's that's sort of you know you would argue that that's sort of the essence of of, of decentralization. But when we talk about the notion of equity, because I think it's uh, Article Fifty Eight has more flexibility to allow equity members um, to the extent that equity members are allowed, um, you know, that they have different voting rights. Does that start to change the nature of the cooperative or potentially even its state securities uh, exemption status? The investors, um, uh, investor members in an LCA um, are not exempt from securities registration in either the state of Colorado or on a federal level. It is only the membership stock that is exempt from registration and exempt from securities regulation. So if you have investors coming in, and you can have investors in a cooperative corporation as well, uh, you issue preferred stock um, in a cooperative corporation as well as an LCA. But in an LCA, the member investor members do have the right uh, to vote on various matters that come before the membership. Uh, there are specific uh, steps in the statute and, and provisions that say that the investor members can never have majority control of the voting rights or in the financial rights of the entity. So it's always the patron members, the members that use the co-op on a daily basis that have the majority of governance rights in an LCA. Thank you. Um, and so shifting to patronage, because I think patron the, the, the definition and what is and isn't patronage is obviously becomes very important uh, when you're structuring a co-op. Um, I guess just a, 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 a couple of questions, like when people contemplate, hey, do, does, is this, mo- you know, is the model that we're contemplating one that actually has something that's patronage? Like how do I, what is patronage? Is patronage providing the platform like as a licensor? Is patronage um, doing other things and then having the members vote on it? Like I, I, obviously the, 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 there may be some interpretive questions surrounding patronage. Uh, anybody want to take a, a crack at that one? Jackie, go ahead. 
I was I was hoping you'd take that relieve me from that one. <laughs> uh, well, it I'll, I'll, on add, the, I'll add on to you. Yeah. So, um, so I mentioned, you know, it's the essentially the action or the activity of you know, providing buying from the cooperative or providing services to the cooperative. Um, so the patronage itself would depend on what what type of cooperatives we're talking about. So think of a grocery store. Uh, it's a consumer cooperative typically, or at its core, it could be maybe a worker as well or a multi stakeholder. Uh, if we're thinking about the worker owners of that grocery store, their patronage activity is providing hours, would typically be providing hours of work to the cooperative. Uh, their consumer members, their patronage activity will be purchasing from the cooperative the goods and services that the cooperative provides. So grocery store, they're providing groceries, the members, patrons will be buying, and that's their patronage activity. Um, so we we'll really be relating to that class of membership activity that's engaged, but essentially providing or acquiring goods or services from it. Linda, how about to add? I like to look at it as how a member uses the co-op. Um, if it's if you're talking, for example, about a platform co-op, um, the member's use of that co-op is how much they get onto the platform, how much they use the services that the platform is providing. That is, is the patronage that, that they are using. Um, if it's a, it's a marketing co-op, uh, it's a group of artists and they want to market, they want to own an art gallery and, and market their, uh, their art through the co-op. Uh, their patronage could be how much rent that they pay for the co-op. Um, to, to rent this gallery, as well as perhaps a percentage of the sales of their art through the gallery. So say they take 2 to 5% uh, of their sales goes off of, the, off of the sale of their piece of art, and it goes to the co-op. So patronage is, is very, very specific to each type of co-op. So you have to look at not just the industry, um, but how the people that are going to be the owners of the business, because they're not just members in terms of governance, they actually own the business. So how, as owners, are they using that business? Well, let's say that in the context of an art gallery, um, one of the members of the cooperative bought out a, a space. In this case, it's aligning with a technology platform, but we'll stay with the we'll stay with the physical sense because that's where we went. Um, I I bought out the space, and then I lease it to the co-op, and or maybe I lease it for a discount rate, and the remainder of it I want to be reflected as patronage. Does that work? You as the art gallery landlord would have to be in a separate class of membership uh, because all of the other members are paying you rent um, and st or they would be paying the co-op rent and the co-op would rent from you. You would just be the landlord. So in that sense, generally, no, you would not even be a member of the co-op because the purpose of the co-op is, is to rent space from the co-op and to sell their art through the co-op. And if the co-op owned the building, that would be one thing. But you as an investor, no. Now, you as an investor could come in and invest in this art project and be a silent investor. And yes, that would be your patronage would be how much money that you put into the co-op. Okay. So so the, the value, to the extent that I'm donating something to the co-op, that could be reflected in the patronage. So, equity. In, in in equity, or let's just say that. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna play with this one a little bit because you because you gave it to me. Okay. Um, so <laughs> so I, a whole bunch of us got together. We all love to paint, and we say let's get this space. And I'm like, listen, guys, you're doing a lot of painting. I'm gonna get this gallery. I'm gonna just I'm gonna just gonna contribute it to the co-op. Let's just say that I, I'm. Very generous. I decided to give it to the co-op. Everybody says, "Whoa, Eric, that's really, really super nice of you. You, you, because you're doing that and you're painting, we're going to give you, you know, we think your patronage value should be a little higher. Like, but well, yeah, but I want to be an investor because I don't, you know, I don't all that security stuff. I just, I'm just a painter with the art gallery, right? Does that fact pattern fly? 
I'm giving, I'm, so I'm like, I'm a contributor. I'm part of the whole, you know. But you the, don't want to be an investor. I don't want to be an investor. I'm a painter. You don't want to return on your money. Well, I, in the form of patronage <laughs> only, right? So, you know, because of this art gallery, people are going in, they're, they're laying out mega bucks and the whole place is, everybody's but benefiting say, because I got a great, in a great spot of town, right? Let's say, let, let, let's, let's call it tokens. Say, say you're given 500,000 tokens for your contribution of the gallery to the co-op. What do those tokens get you? Um, well, I'd actually frame it a little differently. So because mm-hmm. another principle of co-ops, which we, well, we also get it. There's so much to do on this episode. This is great. I love it. So, <laughs> so um, another principle of co-ops is this notion of you don't have sort of this retained equity interest, right? Like, you, you know, if you're an investor, you can say, I own 30%. But let's just say that that the way we want to construct it is really on an annual basis. So let's say next year that the co-op says, Eric, nice try on that gallery. You know, it was in a nice part of town. And then they put up the supersonic tr- railway near it and nobody went to it anymore. And it's worth nothing. And good luck with it. And I'm like, dang it. All right, whatever. And so maybe it takes me a couple of years and I find another beautiful place and I convince everybody like, hey, this is the greatest place. And I'm like, okay. But the notion being is that, y- you know, my return on this art gallery is limited to the patronage that it is contributing to the co-op on an annual basis. So if it does great one year and next year the members say, no, you know, that's not really worth anything. Okay. That kind of stinks, but I don't, I can't say, Hey, I own 35% of the co-op come hell or high water. I'm kind of based on a year to year, um, patronage, uh, and, and, now I'm way out of my way out of my depth here. A patronage assessment. I'm sure Linda's sort of like thinking, did he just say patronage assessment? Yes, I did. As with any other kind of corporate entity, you can contribute non-cash assets, right, in exchange for your membership interests and potentially, I would imagine, for um, tracking kind of a, a larger portion of of patronage as well. So Linda and Jackie, I'll let you jump in on that one. I do want to talk about the, the other securities issues, you know, in a little bit too, but I'll let uh, the patronage assessment topic be covered here. You could, you could change the the word anytime you want. (laughs) The only thing I want to say about that is that, you know, if you want to be an investor and make an investment and not have it being treated as a security, you might need to rethink what your what is your relationship with the business because you know being a cooperative or another uh, legal entity, if it is an investment, it is going to be treated as investment and being a cooperative is not going to prevent it from happening per se. I, I guess maybe it is worth introducing this concept of um, to, a, a number of the jurisdictions have ex- securities exemptions built into the incorporation and securities um, kind of codification of, of the, the law, the cooperative laws. So if you're buying in as a member, um, for example, the Colorado statutes specifically exempt that as, as a security. So kind of the specific um, or the exact uh, references, any security issued or sold by a cooperative association as an investment in its shares or capital to the members is exempt from securities laws in Colorado. Um, and if you are, and, and that's sort of at, at the state level, at the federal level, that has also been confirmed um, in United uh, Housing Foundation versus Foreman, which set a, a three-pronged test on um the restrictions on transferability and expectation of profit and that voting is based on on one vote, one member, one vote. Um, So again, kind of looping that into the conversation and and trying to untangle that from being a pure investor with an expectation of profit that meets the Howey test and then kind of being a a member that is contributing something to the co-op and um, is is also utilizing, you know, the co-op on a patronage basis um, are different concepts. So, so I think what you're telling me is there's no simple answer. I got it. All right. Um, but uh, no, good, good, good point. So obviously, you know, maybe the answer is it depends. <laughs> um, and, and so, so, and, and so this kind of gets to what exactly is, what can be 
patronage? Like what, what would be deemed to be patronage um, in that context? You know, is it, you know, does it have to be some sort of more uniform understanding of patronage, you know, that all the members can participate in or, or that, you know, can it be different for specific contributors due to their, their unique contribution? You can create classes of membership, and I think that's what you're trying to do, um, is, is for you as the contributor of the platform, is create, a pla- is create you as a separate class of membership than, than other members. And your contribution of the platform to the co-op would be your membership interest. Um, is, that, is that the question, or did I misunderstand? Well, you know, I think it, it sort of goes to, you know, if the intent is to sort of, I, I mean, if, if there is no concern about the securities exemption, then arguably it really shouldn't matter, right? Because if I'm an investor and I want to invest in it, and sure, I'm, it's it's an investment. I, I file my Reg D, you know, exemption um, and, and I'm done with it. I, I don't have you know, all that many, that much more concerns because of it. But if the notion is, it's like, you know, we ultimately, we being the cooperative, don't want to raise any securities laws issues whatsoever. We really want to run this um, as a patronage based system in its, you know, in in a way that sort of meets, checks the box so that we don't have to worry about being recharacterized as security for, for potentially issuing the way that we're, uh, awarding or recognizing patronage in the platform, which might be tokens. Um, I guess that's that's the fundamental question that I think I have, and and probably a lot of people who are looking at co-ops and trying to figure out how it fits for them also might have. Um, I don't know if that addresses that directly, but it does answer it. Or maybe I want to give an example of um, DAO LCA that I just recently formed um, that touches on how you're describing yours. So. Uh, Songa Dao, um, who has given information to talk about them. Um, it's essentially a consumer cooperative. The founder um, put this together, worked with us. So they don't have a, a really large team yet, but they have people interested in, in participating. Um, has a couple classes of consumers. Uh, they, The founder provides songs um, to the cooperative. The cooperative mints NFTs of those songs and sell it to the members and the members patronage activity is just purchasing those nfts purchasing the, some rights to those songs um when the cooperative uh, the cooperative will receive revenues from that sale from the membership participation right and then from all royalties as those song the songs get heard here it's essentially a consumer co-op because the founder it, um, himself did not want a specific class or re- returns given or due to the founder statutes uh, as somebody somebody that provides songs, provides kind of the, the goods that will be then sold by the cooperative. Uh, but they could. And in that case, the, that founder's patronage activity per se would be providing the songs. And the more songs they provide, the more patronage refunds or rewards or dividends they would be receiving for that in addition of potential like the payment for the providing that. Um, and on the member side, um, just kind of purchasing those NFTs. And to your point with patronage assessment, we actually started using a patronage uh, token, we're calling it, for that. That's just a unit of accounting that we're using uh, to, that they have adopted to count or to trace the patronage activity of the member. So that is not a money representation uh, per se. It's, they're using PO apps, I believe to count you know, how the member's activity and then just used for, you, know, you have this one token doesn't have interesting value. Um, and so here there isn't, uh, there may be an opportunity for investors at some point, but there isn't. So the securities aspect hasn't been uh, a huge deal or a big problem at all, but it does um, show you, I think from my perspective that you know, the relationship with the founder is somebody that provides value to the cooperative or the DAO as an entity that it can be flexible too. So he could be considered maybe an investor if that was the wish at the beginning. Um, They could have been a member as a member class that has no additional voting rights or return rights, 
or just kind of patronage activity like another member, but just traced or assessed different based on that interaction that, that is providing uh, the goods to the cooperative. And I hope that helps a little bit. I think... I think one of the I think one of the issues or one of the I, I'm seeing a stumbling block that I, I think I can clear up is that an investor makes a one time investment and, or a one time contribution or a one time they give the co-op something, whereas a patron, a, a patron member, somebody who patronizes the co-op, it's an ongoing everyday relationship with the co-op. Uh, so, for example, the founder or you with your art gallery example may come in and contribute the art gallery to the co-op. That would be considered an investment, not patronizing the co-op. So that so that um, uh, they might charge, you know, if you want to try and make it into into a patron situation instead of an investment, there might be annual fees, not an assessment but annual dues or administrative fees that are charged to you as the member. But that doesn't make sense in a co-op on a co-op basis. Cause generally the investors come in and say, okay, I'm going to contribute $50,000 and this is the return that I want. There is no patronage. They don't patronize the co-op in any other way other than giving the co-op something, whether that's goods, whether that's money, whether that's their time and services, there's no additional patronizing of the co-op that the investor has to do. Great. Does that help? It does. And, and, and um, I don't want to stick on it too long because uh, <laughs> I think you explained it very well. And I think, um, you know, one, one question I have in terms of patronage, um, where, the, where the patronage value isn't clear, do the members get to vote and assign the value? Uh, a patronage or does the irs get to vote and assign a value <laughs> or the irs get to vote irs always gets a vote i mean the only thing that are sure is sure in this world is debt and taxes right that's what ben franklin said but uh you know what what is um you, you know where it isn't as 100 percent clear like if you can clearly identify the value of the patronage that's arguably easy but where it isn't um you know let's say that there's a valuation based on expertise that's different you know, than just simply a task performed. How, you know, how is that determined? Is that sort of at odds with the notion of a co-op? Uh, a good example of that is a worker co-op where their patronage is based and the, and their their share of patronage refunds, which, which I like to call them instead of dividends, because they are refunds of the work that has been done, is that instead of, instead of using just hours, that uh, some worker co-ops have created formulas that include seniority, that include uh, job description, as well as hours worked to determine what the patronage was of that particular employee, so employee worker owner. So yes, there are other ways that you can define patronage, and it is something that you usually do at the beginning in the creation of the co-op is figuring out how are we going to determine patronage? So, so going back to my art gallery, but I'm not going down the same road this time. But going back to my art, like he's obsessed with art galleries. So going back to my art gallery, I I am a painter. I donate my art just like every other artist in in this co-op for this art gallery. Somebody walks in and says, "This painting is amazing. Basically, makes a year for the co-op. Huge amount of money." Everybody comes back and says, okay, this is how much you contributed. You painted X, here's yours. You painted X, here's yours. You painted X, here's yours. Oh, hold on. Sorry. I'm the one who sold um, the Beeple equivalent for, you know, nine figures. Um, shouldn't my patronage be worth more? And it would be worth more. Um, uh, you are paid by the co-op for the work that you contributed, but your work created a profit. And, and it's the profit that is used to calculate the refund at the end of the year. It's not how many, you know, if my salary as the janitor versus my salary as the president, it's going to be totally different salary. But if the president only worked half time this year and I worked overtime, I'm going to have a bigger share of the patronage because I, I 
produced more uh, hours. Does that make sense? Sure. Let's say, though, that that at the beginning, I, I always make it more difficult, don't I? Let's say at the beginning, we all sat down and we said, you know what, this is, we love the idea of just like you work what will log how much everybody p takes the time to paint and, you know, how quick it sells. And we have all these little metrics, but it's not perfect. Nobody ever figures this guy comes in for nine uh, for nine figures and picks up this painting. And so we look back, we you know, we look back at the, the, the structure of it. It doesn't align. You know, it's like, oh, we, we got to do the members get to say, OK, we're going to have a vote. <laughs> I'm just thinking about all those you know, alternative scenarios where they're really good. Um, you know, in real life, you're still going to have to trace all that. Right. So uh, some people, you know, come for us for like weighted average. Let's count like, how many years you've given and then your salary and then the, your description of work, all that. Somebody's going to have to trace that in a spreadsheet or some more up, up, updated version of that. It's going to be hard. So why make it harder when you can simplify and kind of having a proportion, proportional might be one simple way you receive proportional to what you've put in versus the whole balance of things. You can attribute different weights and that's fine. But how in practice will that work? I think it's important to at least consider so a, a great answer and, and segueing into another question, which is, what are some of the problems that a co-op might encounter? What are the challenges of a co-op that maybe don't exist, uh, that are unique to a, to a co-op, or maybe more unique to a co-op that don't that may not exist in other structures? Yeah, one one uh, big one is member participation, and, and I don't mean participating on a day to day basis, but participating in the management and operation of the co-op. Uh, think of a credit union. Credit unions are, are a form of co-op. It's a member-owned organization. And uh, the majority of them, mo most of the people that become members of credit unions don't understand that they are owners of the company, that they own that credit union, and that they have a right to participate on the board of directors. They have a right to participate in um, guiding the direction of, of the entity. And so larger co-ops with hundreds of members uh, that's one of the major, major issues. Great. And and I guess also in my example, if you're trying to correct the, the, the patronage all allocation, you may not be able to get all the members to agree, right? Which goes back to Jacqueline's point. You better think about it ahead of time because it may not be as simple as getting together and saying, yeah, we have to allocate more. It's it's much easier if you only have 10 or 15 members versus several hundred members. You actually, you, you actually have the same problem in large DAO networks as well. So if you've got DAOs of hundreds or thousands of members, you have kind of this governance bottleneck. Um, I know that Uniswap had set their quorum at 4% and have yet to reach um, that quorum percentage and, and pass any kind of votes in their DAO. So that's definitely tracks with... Um, Kind of large member-based organizations across the board. To your point with uh, the patronage as well, with the platform cooperatives, what we've kind of been struggling a little bit is finding how to even trace that. How do you, you know keep track of uh, the activity that's done online as well? It's I think it's going to become a, a big deal. Right, definitely, definitely a challenge. Um, one of the things that we, we we talked about in in the context of the DAO is um, membership fees. Um, you know, if, if you pay a membership fee to join the DAO, um, can that appreciate in value? Generally, no. <laughs> that was quick. That was a quick answer. And and that's why and that's why sometimes it makes sense to bifurcate um, the the kind of digital token representation of membership versus patronage. So you would have, for example, membership represented in an NFT, whereas patronage is, is either the native token of the DAO or you know some kind of a separate token. That's why it's outside securities regulation, because it doesn't appreciate in value and there is no expectation of, of return. Uh, a farmer that paid $25 for a co-op membership back in 1950 when he leaves the co-op, he's going to get $25 back. He doesn't get any more than that. And um, how about things like member loans? Can a, another member earn a yield on monies that are lent through the co-op? Of course, that's just a, a lender 
relationship. Even if the, you know, there has to be disclosure to the other members that this member is lending money to the co-op and there has to be approval of that loan. But other than that, it's just a loan. Where do you find misalignment in what people uh, think, a, think a, a co-op is going to mean for a DAO versus what it actually means for a DAO? It's a good question. I think that typically if people are coming to us, they've they've decided that they want to be compliant, right? That they want to find a way to limit liability get across the members, that they want to p- find a way to pay their taxes, that they want, that they're looking at different kind of structures that are out there that, that make sense for them, whether it is a co-op or not. Um, we also do a lot of consulting on maybe kind of siloing out legal, the proper legal entity structure for different functions of the DAO, whether it is, you know, the treasury should rest in, uh, an LLC or an unincorporated nonprofit association, whether the governance protocol should really rest in the DAO co-op, whether it, you know, it does make sense for everything to be combined under one umbrella. Great. And, and one of the things, one of the benefits I think that, that the co-op structure gives for membership is fluidity of membership. Um, you know, oftentimes when we, w- one of the reasons why a lot of DAOs, one of the reasons that they remain unincorporated is because it's, it's a very fluid membership structure. People, you know, it's hard to sort of know who's a member uh, necessarily. People come in, people come out. Uh, co-op arguably uh, addresses that because, you know, it ultimately boils down to patronage and participation and that sort of acts as by design as a, you know, as a vehicle to manage the fluidity. Is that what you find? I think if that's how you define it by laws, potentially. Right. So you, you still usually kind of sign up to be a member and you have activity. You're not necessarily going to not be a member because you don't have activity. You're not going to have a patronage return or refund if you're not a, a member. But uh, if you're not producing activity, but you're still a member. Um, what some groups I've seen do is you know, for lack of activity, you could no longer be a member, you, the, the cooperative essentially decides that unilaterally. If you haven't engaged in an activity or participated for a year or two or more, uh, we're just going to clean up the files whenever we get to it, and, and that's fine. Is pseudonymity uh, consistent with a co-op structure, like where members are pseudonymous? I'm not going to go to anonymity because that might raise um, other issues. But is pseudonymity consistent or inconsistent, or too hard of a question? I was thinking of in terms of, uh, I always go back to the IRS. Yeah, that's why <laughs> I took off the not anonymity. <laughs> and because the IRS requires, if if there is a profit, if the entity is a for-profit entity and, and there is a profit and there is a tax return, then part of that tax return is a allocation of the profits to the members and you have to have a t- uh, social security number or some kind of tax ID number to get to the IRS. Right. And so the, 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 so on an annual basis, what would be the, what do co-op members get? Like in an, L, an LLP, you have a K1. If you're a, a corporation, you don't, you might have a 1099 for specific contributions, but what, what does that look like for a, uh, a cooperative? Or does it just depend on the election? Well, if it's a subchapter T taxed co-op, you get a 1099 dash PATR stands for patronage, just like a 1099 div or a 1099 INT. It's a 1099 PATR, and uh, at least, and and it shows your entire allocation of profits, at least twenty percent of which had to have been paid to you in cash. Oh, twenty percent has to be paid in cash. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so, uh, tether doesn't count. <laughs> I don't even know what <laughs> she's not even is. going there. <laughs> the answer is no. Um, and so, so for the cooperatives themselves, um, there's, it, 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 from my understanding, there are sort of, you know, you could be taxed under two different regimes. A co-op can be taxed as either a C-corp or a subchapter T corp, or as a partnership. You can have partnership taxation in co-ops, at least in an LCA co-op. And, 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 and how it's tracked is that 
again, it goes back to which, how the revenue is generated by the co-op. Is the revenue generated by the members or is the revenue generated by non-members? Uh, if it's revenue generated by non-members, then it's taxed to the co-op at corporate tax rates. Revenue generated by the members uh, is uh, profits are allocated to the members and they get their, K, their 1099 PATIs. And that is deducted at the co-op level. So we are at time. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming on the podcast. This was great. Great to have the Dream Team uh, setting me straight on some things and, and providing education to the listeners. So thanks so much. Have a great day. Thank you, Eric. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Now, Jacqueline came back after the podcast to clarify a taxation point. As noted, cooperatives can be taxed as C-corporations, pass-through entities, or under subchapter T, which is a co-op-specific tax treatment, effectively a combination between a C-corp and a pass-through. See, under subchapter T, the profit generated by non-members and the amounts retained by the cooperative are taxed at the cooperative level like a C-corp. But the surplus generated by members and which is distributed is taxed only at the member level. This surplus can be tax distributed in cash, cash equivalent, notices of allocation, and unqualified notices of allocation. If the distribution is by notice of allocation, the co-op must pay at least 20% in cash or cash equivalent. Otherwise, it'll have to advance the taxes on behalf of the member.